What's up everyone and thank you for stopping by the channel. Today's project is this steel trimmer and the problem is that it's fresh out of storage and it simply will not start. Let's take a good look at it, find out what's wrong with it and hopefully we can fix it. In this video, we try and repair this trimmer. However, it may not be the exact repair you need to make to yours. We'll explore other options later in the video. I'm not sure how you feel about this particular model of steel trimmer, but it's extremely unique. Also, having a curved shaft makes it less desirable to taller users, but for the residential market, it worked quite well. This particular example wasn't used very much, but it wasn't taken care of either. It looks like it was thrown around a bit and the previous owner tried to work on it but gave up and hastily threw it back together. All in all, it's in decent shape and I think it's worth fixing. Before we start working on this trimmer, I want to realign the shaft to the engine as it's sitting kind of crooked. Also, the guard is kind of loose, so I want to tighten that up as well. Another reason why your trimmer might not be starting is that the choke system may not be working like it's supposed to. This round choke dial on the back was loose, but I think that happened after they tried fixing it. Its purpose was to move the lever on the carburetor to close the choke flap. If we move the lever, we can see that it's working like it's supposed to, so I don't think that was the problem. Before we go any further though, I want to make sure the engine will even run by pouring some fuel into the carburetor's throat and then try starting it. And fortunately for us, it ran for just a second, so we'll continue. Now, if it didn't start, we would check to make sure that it had spark. The second thing I want to check for is that there's enough engine compression. If you pull slowly on the rope, you should feel the engine fight back. If it doesn't, then the engine might be worn out. It would be ideal, though, if you had a compression tester. That way you could get a compression reading versus a feeling on how worn out the engine is. We would like to get a reading over 50 PSI and up to 90 PSI, but anything below 50 PSI and we'd have to consider possibly getting a new top-end kit. You could buy one online for a few dollars or ask a mechanic to borrow one. Just remove the spark plug and screw in the tester, squeeze the throttle, and then pull on the rope a few times. This isn't a definitive answer to how worn out the engine is, but it's a good indicator. And this would be one of those times where the compression tester doesn't give a definitive answer. The reading is about 55 PSI, and the only thing we can get from this reading is that the engine is still somewhat usable. That means we'll try and see if we can get it running. Remove the tester and then reinstall the spark plug, and then remove the rear cover so we can get to the carburetor. The carburetor is literally covered in dirt and debris, so I'll blow off as much as I can and then disconnect the fuel lines and the throttle cable. Before I disassemble the carburetor, I'll also wipe off as much dirt as possible. Now this is the first time I've ever seen this steel logo on this metering plate before. Now the first thing I like to do is remove the top bolt on the pump side and check out if the pumping diaphragm is still usable. If not, we'll consider getting a rebuild kit or a new carburetor. The round screen is not clogged with debris, so it means that the fuel filter is still attached to the line in the tank, which is great news for us. The next thing I want to check is that the two check valve flaps are parallel with the rest of the diaphragm by looking at them from the side. And luckily for us, it's still usable, so the next thing we'll do is remove the metering plate and examine the metering diaphragm. Well, the plate was really stuck to the diaphragm, and it looks like I might have damaged it with the screwdriver. It really doesn't matter, though, as it looks like the diaphragm is petrified, which is not good. It's supposed to be very flexible, so we have to change it anyway. To replace it, we'll just pull it away from the gasket. Now, before we replace the diaphragm, I want to test that the needle assembly and the screen will allow fuel to flow through the carburetor. Just pour some fuel on the screen and depress the rocker arm on the opposite side of the carburetor and hopefully the fuel will disappear from the screen. And fortunately for us, it allowed the fuel to flow through the carburetor, so let's replace the diaphragm and put the carburetor back together. 
before you replace the diaphragm, make sure that the replacement diaphragm has the same length stem in the middle of the metal piece. Some are very short, while this one is one of the longer ones. Now, if it didn't flow through the carburetor, we would have to remove the needle and rocker arm assembly and make sure that the needle seat wasn't clogged. We might also have to soak the screen in some carburetor cleaner as well. The next part I do not suggest that you do. If you do, it's up to you. The fuel adjustment screws have been limited to keep the users from making huge changes and only allow slight adjustments. I would rather bypass it now than remove the carburetor and do it later on. There's a plate around the screws that we need to remove and I'm gonna grind around the plate to remove it. Now after I remove the plate around the screws, I'm going to leave the red limiter caps on the screws until I need to make more than just minor adjustments. I know it looks kind of rough, but it still works. We now have more range to make adjustments, and since we did replace the metering diaphragm, we shouldn't need to make a lot of adjustments at all. It's finally time to reinstall the carburetor back on the engine. Start by reconnecting the throttle cable and then the primer bulb line followed by the fuel filter line. After that, we can then replace the rear cover and the air filter and the choke dial. If you don't want to perform this bypass, I would suggest buying a new carburetor instead. However, if it's your trimmer, you do what you want. If you're repairing this trimmer for someone else, make sure you ask them first before doing this bypass. Now I'm gonna hold off from installing the filter and the choke dial until we get it mostly dialed in. After putting some fresh fuel in the tank, press the primer bulb until it fills up with fuel, and then we'll try and start it. Now this part was really interesting. I had to press the primer bulb a total of 60 times, yes I counted, before it filled with fuel, but afterwards it worked like it was supposed to. Now I may consider replacing the bulb later on if it happens again though. Well, it keeps dying, so it seems to need a little bit more fuel to stay idling. The screw we need to turn is the L screw, which is closer to the engine. We'll turn it counterclockwise about half a turn, and I'm sorry for the poor visibility, they don't make this very easy to film.
so it starts and runs after a slight adjustment, but it won't rev up. Even after adjusting the H screw, it didn't make a difference, so there may be a blockage in the muffler or a throttle cable issue. Also, the kill switch isn't working like it's supposed to, so we'll need to fix that as well. And unfortunately, this is the end of this video, but in the next video, we'll address these issues and resolve them. So my question is, would you have removed the adjustment screw limiter, or would you have bought a new carburetor instead? I know how I feel about it, but I'm more curious about your answer. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate your time. Please feel free to ask any questions, and I hope to see you in my next video.